There are moments in life that just unfold that don't have easy answers. I'll tell you a story of one. I was going to the hospital to visit a family of a church member who was in the final hours of life. His caregiver was his adult daughter. She had painstakingly, lovingly cared for her dad day after day for over a year. And he was finally stable enough. There was enough surrounding support from family that she decided to take a quick getaway on vacation with one of her friends. She hadn't done it in over a year. Of course, while she was gone, her dad took a turn for the worse and he died. I was there in the hospital. I was the one that made the phone call to her to tell her that her dad had been rushed to the ER. I was the one who had to call her back hours later to say that your dad had died. She was 45 minutes from arriving at the hospital. She didn't make it. I will tell you the sound that she made on the phone when I called to tell her that her dad had passed away. I can only describe it as deep suffering. There is just so much grief that encompasses us when death strikes. I think about this a lot, that grief is just everywhere. It comes at us from every angle. There aren't easy answers that satisfy the pain that it unveils. It really forces me to recall a moment in the Gospels, Luke chapter 2. It's the story right after Jesus was born, he was to be taken to the temple to be dedicated like most babies are. And then it was to be done by this person named Simeon. That's the part of the story that we kind of hold on to. The scripture says Simeon was guided by the spirit to come in to the temple and to bless Jesus, declaring him the salvation of the world. And that's supposed to be the rhythm that Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to the temple. Simeon's like, oh yes, he is going to be the savior of the world. But then scripture takes a turn. Simeon looks at mother Mary and says, your son's death is going to feel like a sword has pierced your soul. Families who have to bury loved ones especially parents who are forced to bury their own children, they understand acutely what that phrase means. A sword has pierced your soul. I'm not sure this kind of pain ever goes away either. We all know the sting that death brings and the pain, it just doesn't dissolve. But life does go on. People around us continue to live their life and we are the ones who have to learn to walk with a limp like a sword had pierced our soul. In theology, there's a construct, a framework that's called the wisdom path and it helps me so much in to speak to all of this. A lot of people use different words. A year ago, I introduced this with these three words, order, disorder, reorder. It's the natural rhythm of things. Life starts easy, orderly, rule-based, but eventually those moments don't last. Complexity ushers us into phase two of disorder. You know, those who study thermodynamics have a word for this phase two. It's called entropy. You should look that up. Entropy is the reality that things, no matter what, no matter how hard you try, things will break. Things are going to move from order to disorder. That's just the nature of life and things. As it turns out, that's also the nature of faith. A lot of people stay in this phase two stage, honestly, for the majority of their lives. And their faith will stay in that stage too. Phase two, disorder. It really creates jaded, cynical people 
who've experienced so much loss and so much death and so much brokenness, they are left wounded by it, but what they don't develop are the coping skills to deal with it. A sword has pierced their soul, but they have not learned how to walk with a limp. They're just disordered. People in this phase two, they just don't have the tools necessary to get past their pain. They are walking wounded and they're usually bitter and sour people because of it. I mean, think about how many of your friends, or it might even be you, who live with this encoded form of cynicism. Or maybe you just constantly live in a state of doubt or distrust. We know people like this, and at times we are these people because we've been thrust up onto the shores of disorder. We've parked our boat there for so long that we've lost sight of why, how we even can get out. Deep down, we know that things aren't perfect and things will not stay perfect. There's just a fly in the ointment of life. But wisdom, the wisdom of the Lord, if you're open to it, can pull you out of phase two and move you into a phase three faith where you reorder the disorder. Wisdom is what helps pull us out into this new space. It moves us from our brokenness to joy. It's a place in life where we realize, yes, there is darkness, but there are also moments of light. Phase three, this reorder, it captures actually some of the uniqueness and freshness of phase one, where things feel simplistic and beautiful, but it also does not diminish the pain of phase two, of the disorder. It takes with it the pain of life and the joy of life, and we find a whole new level of depth. And surprisingly, phase three has the necessary depth needed to cause a chain reaction for our faith to reorder. And wisdom is the catalyst for this. Wisdom reorders our disorder. And this is why people who study thermodynamics, this is why they really do have a strong word for this. Engineers know that you only get to this depth by going through the entropy. You can't reorder something without it breaking first. Order will always give way to disorder. And that's just necessary to get to reorder. And the book of Job, Job himself is the perfect example to prove this point. Last week, we introduced this great epic of a story. Just to remind you, this is how Job 1 opens. And it's so nice, so wonderful. It's in the land of order in just the perfect way. Here's Job 1.1. There once was a man in the land of, I don't know how you say it. I really want to say Oz, but it's not Oz. Uz, whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. It's a perfect little bow. Life is simple and rich and rewarding and fun. And there are simple solutions to dealing with the idiosyncrasies of life. Everything is perfectly ordered until it's not. Job 1 gives way to Job 2. And Job loses everything and fast. His servants are killed, the 7,000 sheep, 500 yoke of oxen are killed, the 3,000 camels are killed, the house in which the 10 children were having a party collapsed on itself, all the children died, the property was lost, sores opened up from the crown of Job's head to the sole of his foot. Job went from the richest in the land to the lowest, most broken person in the land. And it happened between Job 1 and Job 2. And then 
it just stayed that way for 42 more chapters. Order gives way to disorder, and then you just stay in it. Some people, forever. 37 of those 42 chapters, we see Job is shipwrecked on the shores of disorder. And as we said last week, his friends try to come and help, but they can't. Job learns quickly and he learns often. There is not a one-step, quick fix, one-liner that you can offer to move you through the land of disorder. There's just not. Job is stuck on the shores of disorder and he has to sit there for a while. Which brings up a huge point that we need to see. We're not gonna magically move on from our grief just because we want to, especially not in a day, or because someone told us at some point a sentence that helped them. Grief is a process. It takes time. Wisdom comes to us from God, but it is hard fault. You have to do the hard work of going through the stages of grief, the levels of pain, the feelings of sadness, if you're going to arrive at wisdom. It's as if the entire book of Job was written to teach us this. You don't get through the land of disorder quickly, and you don't get through it pain-free. Tragedy strikes in the first two chapters for Job, and then he just stays disordered for 39 more. Job had to learn to walk with a limp because a sword had pierced his soul. And that's the painful truth of all of our lives. There is a fly that gets in our ointment. Things break down. The zeal and hope of life wanes. But, and this is so great, God is with us when it does or when we do. And that's also what Job teaches us. Entropy, disorder, deep suffering, it's going to unfold. But God is with us in the midst of it. And if we're wise or we want to be wise, we'll do what Job does. We'll keep taking our sadness to God. We will work through those feelings of grief and pain. We will keep offering all that we are in a state of prayer. And eventually, over time, and it could be weeks, could be months. Honestly, it's more like decades. Eventually, we will feel God respond. We will intuit what God's wisdom is for us. And it will move us to healing. This happens twice to Job, by the way. Chapters 38 and chapters 41. God responds to the pain that Job is offering to God. Job is in the midst of his disorder and God eventually speaks. Now, you would think I would now read that passage to you, but we don't have time for that. You need to go back and read chapters 38 and 41, if you want to hear God's response to Job. Because what we read earlier in Job 42 is Job's response to God's response. This is our text today. And it shows perfectly how Job moves from disorder to reorder. So Job 42, 1 through 6. Then Job answered the Lord. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you and you declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Let me help you see what's going on here. Job has finally accepted the pain of his life and he's ready to move forward with God. 
He arrives at a new level of consciousness and a new level of wisdom here because he's moving from his anguish to acceptance. But I can't say this enough. It does not happen quickly or easily. I mean, it takes him 39 chapters to get here. He could have stayed cynical. He could have let his life just unravel in the phase two disorder kind of thinking. But eventually he learns to despise that life. Look at verse six. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. What he despises is who he's become in phase two. He wants to reorder his soul. He's ready to move beyond the cynicism. He's ready to move past the anger and to arrive at new life. Look at verses two through five. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear and I will speak. I will question you and declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. What Job is saying is he has learned to despise disorder. He's ready to step in to reorder. And this is what we need to hold and embrace and learn if we want to accept the wisdom of the Lord. We aren't going to come out of our pain, whatever it is. We're not going to come out of it unscathed. But with God's help, we can come out of it. We can turn our disorder into reorder. And if we have the chance to do it, we will come out as better versions of ourselves. We will come out as people who are closer and understand more clearly the divine. But we have to take our pain and our frustration to God. If we're willing to wrestle with those feelings, if we're willing to wrestle with them until God helps us come out on the other side, then we will receive the wisdom of the Lord. This is what Job does. He goes from order to disorder to reorder. It is the path of wisdom. It hurts, but it'll lead us to new life.